Let's get started. Welcome. Uh, welcome. This is our first uh, meeting of 2015. Woo! We, uh, yes, year two. So thank you for coming. Yes. Uh, Papers we love 2015. Woo. I think this is our, is this, how many people? Is this our largest one? This I is think. our largest yes, one. Yes, our largest yeah. RSVPs. Thank you for saying that you were coming and thank you for showing up. Most of you came. Yes. School, yeah. It's great. So uh, a little bit, we start normally this with a mini trivia. The bathrooms are over there. Uh, we have uh, pretty much the entire year planned already. So our next speaker is sitting over there. So Katie's going to be talking. Woo! Yes, February. So don't miss her talk. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, we're going to get started. Oh. Well, well, first of all, administrative yes. stuff. Yes. So uh, in case you missed this announcement previously, we're doing a new thing this year where we do about two mini talks, um, like mini papers we love per meetup every month, um, which is basically a lightning talk. Um, about your favorite paper. So if you, and that's due to Ines being super organized and having the whole year planned. So, so if you want to speak, yeah, yeah just if like you want to speak, there's me. still opportunities. Yes. And it's good to like get your feet wet with small little things. Mm -hmm. I think we have February covered, but March is completely open. So if you have an idea, a paper, or something that you like, and you can present it in five to seven minutes, I'm, I'm happy to help you, especially if it's the first time or if you don't know what, what you want to talk about, just like email me and then I, I'm, I'm just like, yeah. It, we want more people and we want more faces or so we want more ideas to be shared and, and with a group. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and just another administrative thing is um, we're going to do a Q&A after Alex's talk and also after the lightning talk. And um, uh, Inez and I will pass mics around um, for so, yeah. that. So just watch out for that. Raise your hand. If you have a question, we'll come get you a mic. Yes. Uh, so we're going to start the year. Uh, Sargon actually decided to have a topic or have a talk for his mini that complemented the paper. So we decided to leave him a little bit more wiggle room and then just like maybe combine the two of them with his because it's like an introduction to what the topics that the paper was going to cover. So let's give it up for Sargon. Hey, um, so I'm going to be talking about VL2. Um, a scalable and flexible data center network. And the reason I chose to give this talk is it's actually very closely related with the FDS paper that Alex is going to talk about later on. And in fact, there's a small reference to the uh, FDS paper inside of the VL2 paper. Um, but before that, a little bit about me. Um, Sargon Dillon, if you want to get in touch with me after this talk, here's my contact information. Um, so I'm going to cover VL2 in a couple different ways. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with the design goals and really what the folks at Microsoft are trying to achieve uh, with VL2. And then I'm going to shed a little bit of light on the history and context of where we came from and what networks used to look like before VL2 existed and, and kind of the effects that VL2 has had. And then go on into the actual implementation of the, the network that uh, VL2 is using and then a bit of a discussion of how that network enables future applications and data centers. So the design goals of VL2 are pretty straightforward in the sense that they wanted a scalable network that's going to be reliable and still have layer 2 semantics. So what do they mean by uh, a scalable network? They mean a network with high capacity. They wanted a network where the servers were not bound by the fabric, but yet they were bounded only by the ability for the systems to produce traffic. Um, and they wanted full bisection bandwidth. And full bisection bandwidth effectively means that at any point of the network, if you cut it, or in the worst point of the network, if you cut it, there's an equal amount of bandwidth on both sides. And in reliability, they were aiming for performance isolation. One of the things that the uh, authors of the paper pointed out is that as cloud computing is becoming more and more ubiquitous, there are heterogeneous applications that are running on these fabrics that don't necessarily get along super well. So how do we make those agree? And lastly, they wanted layer 2 semantics. And what they needed by, by layer 2 semantics is the ability for servers to move throughout the network. And additionally, they wanted individual servers to contact one another without having to go through any kind of uh, proxy layer or anything like that. So a little bit of context of where we came from. So layer 2 networking used to be ubiquitous inside of data centers. And layer 2 networking is you know, what most of us call Ethernet. In Ethernet, we all use MAC addresses. Uh, which were assigned to physical devices. They were actually burned into your NIC. And uh, as of recently, when we transitioned to one gigabit networking, we've left behind hubs and CSMA, CD, and we've all moved into switched networks. And it, it requires a minimum spanning tree in order to work, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. 
But there's three semantics for the kinds of traffic you have in layer two networks. You have unicast traffic, broadcast traffic, and multicast traffic. So that's pretty straightforward. So talking a bit about how to uh, layer two networks work and look, they actually look like fat trees. And fat trees are a specific implementation of the clos topology that requires that every layer above the lower layer is the sum of the capacity at that lower layer. Um, that means that you have to scale up your switches as you go up in the infrastructure, and that becomes very expensive very, very quickly. So a little bit about the learning aspect of how the actual switching happens and, and why that's a problem. So in learning in a layer two network, the servers aren't necessarily announcing where they are. Learning is a passive operation. So if server A wants to send a packet to server B in this network, none of the switches know where to send that traffic. So that's handled in a unique, scenario, in a unique case called unknown unicast, where the traffic is actually handled as broadcast traffic. So what occurs is that that switch will flood every port on the network, except the port that that traffic came from. And in doing that, the MAC address table is populated on all of the servers around, all the switches around the switch that that traffic originated from until the traffic has spread out throughout the entire network and everyone knows where that server that originated the traffic from exists. This can be problematic in several senses, um, in the sense that it'll continue to loop if we're in a graph. So how do we deal with that? We use spanning tree. Um, a spanning tree protocol was invented by Radio Perlman uh, way back in the day, and it's really the protocol that's made the modern internet work. And what that means is that we have to reduce the network down to a minimum spanning tree. So we have to block all links in the graph that allow loops and turn it into a tree to prevent the loop scenario in your traffic from constantly flowing throughout the network and causing a storm. So layer three is what rides on top of layer two. It's the next layer in the OSI model. And it's a little bit different in the sense that uh, it uses IP addresses to, to locate things. And these are uh, ephemeral. They can move around the network. Um, and additionally, they, they don't use a switch network, they use a router network in the sense that uh, devices are only making local decisions and they don't have to be aware of the entire topology in order to make these decisions. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, the paper talks about OSPF, which is a link state protocol, and it's a dynamic protocol, but you can also do this statically where you pre-program all the uh, devices in the network. So, Switches only need to know about the next top, and these can be hierarchical entries as opposed to having to have a full entry of all of the 48-bit addresses in the network. And the way that you tie layer two and layer three together is using a protocol called ARP, which uses the broadcast semantics of layer two networks in order to determine the IP address to uh, MAC address relationship. And this can either be gratuitous or non-gratuitous in the sense that if a new device comes on the network, it can actually announce its location. So, What's wrong with these traditional designs? Um, these traditional designs had limited server to server capacity. As I mentioned before, the fat tree networks, as you get higher and higher in layers, those devices have to get larger and larger. And that can become very, very expensive very quickly. And in that sense, there was often segregation of these layer two networks. In um, a ACMQ article by uh, Bayless and Kingsbury, they actually referenced a lot of the issues related to layer two networks. Um, and how those were considered to be failure domains. And by sharding those domains, they were able to make the network significantly more reliable. And in that same sense, because we have to reduce the network down to a minimum spanning tree, reliability and utilization is a major pain. If you have N plus one redundancy, you're never actually gonna be able to use that entire capacity that you've purchased. You're realistically only gonna be able to use 50% of the capacity or less in a production network. So what do we wanna build for? We want to build for a data center network. We want to build for unpredictable traffic patterns with heterogeneous applications. And those heterogeneous applications produce two kinds of flows primarily. Elephant, which are large flows, and mice, which are things like RPCs. And additionally, we want fault tolerance. So if an individual device dies in the network, it's not going to cause an interruption of the flows in the network. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the VL2 topology and the actual implementation that they used. So the topology itself is a scale out topology as opposed to a scale up topology. In the sense that they're adding devices horizontally as opposed to buying very large devices. Um, and then they use OSPF for reconvergence and for routing the layer three addresses in the network. And their network also supports encapsulation, which allows them to do clever things around flow steering and traffic steering. So, I talked a little about how layer three networking works traditionally and layer two networking works traditionally in the sense that it has one canonical address for the device. 
But instead of that, they actually added two addresses. The first address, which is the uh, LA, is designated to a physical device. So an individual switch could have an LA. A server that's outside of VL2 could have an LA. Servers and devices within VL2 would have application addresses, AAs. And this allows us to do clever things around building virtualized networks on top of those physical networks. Another novel insight that the uh, topology has is that they, they added an interesting mechanism for load balancing. So they're using two mechanisms, actually. Uh, the first mechanism that they went with was uh, valiant load balancing, which for this is effectively randomized load balancing. And one of the nice things that was pointed out in the valiant load balancing paper is that it can handle arbitrary traffic matrices in a non-blocking manner. Um, addition to that, they use ECMP. And ECMP basically takes a hash of the five tuple of the packet in order to determine the next hop for that packet. And the reason why it does this is that uh, you get flow-based load balancing. And the reason why you want flow-based load balancing is that the TCP transmission model expects a roughly ordered layer to ride on top of. Otherwise, the congestion control algorithm shrinks the congestion window uh, to basically make the protocol unusable. Um, and also, they had an AnyCast-enabled network. And AnyCast is basically where multiple devices will announce the same LA in order to handle failover and ECMP-based traffic sharding. The last component that they added in the topology was the directory server. And the directory server is a uh, device which maps the LAs to the AAs. And they did a couple of clever things here. The first thing that they did is for uh, making changes to that. Uh, they had a Paxos state machine that they went through, but all of the actual queries weren't done against these uh, state machines. They were actually done to replicated caching instances, and they also had active cache invalidation to enable changing LA to AA mappings very quickly. Additionally, layer two access controls rode on top of the directory server, so if a server was asking for a route to a specific host, the directory server could actually enforce security semantics based on you know, knowledge about the network. So what does a topology actually look like? Uh, it's a class topology with a larger spine and full bisection and has uh, ECMP to load balance between sets of spines. So in this network, there's a four wide spine. That four wide spine is actually split into two sections. Um, and the reason why that's split into two sections is because ECMP in commodity networking hardware typically has a width that it's bound by. In the paper, they point out that most commodity networking gear has a four-way uh, width for ECMP. And although there's vendors that talk about 256-way width, this severely limits the size of the TCAM and the number of entries that you can have in there. Um, and then the actual AAs are assigned addressing space in different addressing space from the LAs. So what does an actual host communicating need to do? When an actual host tries to communicate, it contacts the directory server and it asks, where, how do I get to this AA? And there's an agent running on the server itself that intercepts ARP requests and that intercepts packets in order to uh, trigger these directory lookups. And the directory server gives it one of the AnyCast addresses that's assigned to a pool of spines. And in doing that, it's able to assign labels on top of those spines in order to drive that traffic. So the first label that's put on top of it is the penultimate hop, and then the top label is the spine hop. And in doing this, as it traverses the network, that packet is de-encapsulated until it gets to the uh, penultimate hop. In that case, it's the actual packet itself. So you're probably curious as to how this is handled in failure, and that's where ECMP and AnyCast come in. Because those pods of spines have any cast addresses, in failure, OSPF reconvergence kicks in, and it results in that traffic being redirected the other or to the other spine in that pod. So a bit of a summary. Um, VL2 shifts the intelligence and routing decisions of the network from the network itself into the hosts. And it's relatively simple in the sense that it doesn't have a centralized controller like so many SDN implementations that have been proposed do. And the data plane itself is just doing very, very simple routing operations as opposed to trying to do complex encapsulation and de-encapsulation. Um, and those encapsulation, de-encapsulation uh, operations it's performing are, are hard programmed into the network. So a little bit of discussion of, of why they made these decisions. Um, so one of the big things that they talk about in the paper is the volatility of traffic patterns inside of the network. So given that you can have elephants that collide with mice, how do we deal with that? The way that they talk about it in the paper is that even though these rarely occur, they need to be able to rehash these flows in order to prevent them from colliding. 
In addition to that, they use the TCP congestion control to have a non-interfering network. So, I mean, that's ideal to have a non-interfering network. Worst case scenario, they move the traffic around. Additionally, because they're using such simple chips, they're able to use commodity hardware, and that means that they're using fixed 1RU switches. These devices are actually some of the most reliable devices in networks today. They have like a 0.1% failure rate. <coughs> and lastly, the network is built on top of proven technology. So it's using technology that the internet has actually used for decades and decades before it. And then the replicated state machines are using a Google or a Microsoft implementation that allows them to very easily do this. There's already built in DAP uh, work that they had done previous to this. So some other benefits that you get from this by separating out the AAs and the LAs is you get host high availability, meaning that hosts can move throughout the network very, very quickly. You enable end host to, to control the data plane without having to necessarily work with the data plane. And when there's failures in the network, they typically affect less than 25% of the traffic in the network. So what is the actual effect of this? Today, in 2015, these networks are very, very common to have virtualized layer two networks on top of layer three fabrics. In fact, Amazon recently published a patent on using this very technology with MPLS as opposed to IPIP. And it showed me that you can build reliable, scalable networks with full bisection bandwidth out of commodity devices. And um, there's a handful of related material of pieces of work that have been published around this. Other than that, are there any questions? Oh, um, so the question was, in real life, do mice and elephant collisions not happen often? So in the paper, they talk about this in section 4.6. And um, what they did, so there's actually two parts of the paper. The, one part of the paper is the design. One part of the paper is an actual survey of traffic patterns inside of data center networks. So they actually took a data center fabric from Microsoft and looked at what was occurring, and they found that traffic patterns are basically random. The best fit traffic pattern they could come up with had a 60% best fit. So given that, the first problem was you can never predict it. So don't even try. The second part of that is in the actual server, they, they rarely saw these collisions happen in real life where there was actual interference. Um, it was something like less than 1% of overall traffic. Fantastic. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Rasmussen. Uh, and tonight uh, it is my pleasure to be talking to you about flat data center storage. Uh, this is a paper that came out of a group of folks at Microsoft Research uh, in 2012. It was presented at uh, the USENIX Symposium for Operating Systems Design and Implementation, otherwise known as OSDI. It's one of the biggies in the systems world. Um, this paper is, I'm really excited to share this paper with you um, because I think that it's a great example of what a scalable data system design looks like when it's really well thought out and executed flawlessly. Uh, I think it has a lot to teach us about ways that these systems can be constructed and kind of general overarching kind of mental frameworks that we can use to inform how we design these systems in the future. Um, so yeah. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank a few people. Um, first, uh, thanks to Fastly for providing the funding to put this together. Thanks in particular uh, to Inez and Elaine for putting all this stuff together and doing all the logistics. Yeah, absolutely, please. A round of applause to them. Um, you know, this has been said by other speakers in the past, but this is really just an invaluable resource and gives a chance for academics and, and industrial people to really kind of exchange ideas and interface, and, and it's, I wish there was more like this out there. Um, thank you to GitHub for providing this just superlative space to give this talk in. Um, thanks to the authors, uh, first for writing the paper and second for putting their slides online so that I could steal from them. Um, and finally, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I am impressed and amazed at the turnout. Um, so yeah, my name's Alex Rasmussen. Um, I'm an engineer at a company called Trifacta. Uh, Trifacta does data transformation software. I like to say that we make washing machines for data and we do it better than anybody else. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about that, uh, please come find me after the talk. Uh, we are hiring. Um, I'm Alex Rass on everything 
mostly on Twitter, uh, so you know, stalk away. Uh, before I started at Trifacta, uh, I was a graduate student for six years at the University of California, San Diego, um, working a lot on efficient data processing at scale. So a lot of the work that I did uh, centered around two big pieces of work. The first one was a system called Triton Sort that sorted stuff really fast. The other one was a system called Themis that did MapReduce on stuff really fast. Um, between those two systems, uh, we managed to set a few world records in sorting, which uh, I'm pretty proud of. Um, all of this is kind of, number one, kind of a humble brag, and number two, uh, a great digression to the fact that, like, I've been thinking a lot about big data <laughs> um, for about, like, the last eight years. It's kind of been what I've been immersed in, and I've, I've been looking at it both kind of from an academic context and an industrial context. And one of the things that I like a lot about this paper that we're about to discuss is that it starts by kind of Coming at, it, coming at the problem from this very green fields, kind of stereotypical, almost academic approach of, you know, what can we do if physics and money weren't an option? Um, and then brings that into to parity with reality in a way that actually comes out looking really elegant and nice. So uh, given that uh, often in technology the, uh, the ideals are much more uh, pleasant to talk about, let's start by examining what a perfect world would look like if you were a big data person, right? If you wanted to build a big data system uh, and money and physics were not an object, what would you build? So you probably build something that looks a lot like this, right? And in this block diagram, you've got a bunch of these little guys up here and they're processors. And their job is to take data items in, do something interesting with them, and then write data items out again. And then on the bottom, you've got these disks and of course, disks are there for storing data and giving it back to you when you ask for it. And the processors and the disks are connected together with this thing in the middle that I'm gonna call magic RAID, which behaves a lot like RAID except magical, and I'll tell you why. So magic RAID's got a lot of nice properties. The first nice property that magic RAID has is that if you write data to magic RAID, it stripes that data in really, really fine granularity across all of your disks. And the reason why that's nice is because if you've got a lot of things that are reading and writing data items off of this giant pool of disks underneath magic RAID at the same time, you can kind of statistically assume that number one, all of your disks are being kept busy, they've all got stuff to do, and number two, your processors are all gonna get pretty good bandwidth because they'll be able to read from a high diversity of these disks at the same time. By the way, we're assuming like spinning rust and platters here, not SSDs, although there's nothing that really is predicated on the existence of magnetic disks for this work. Another nice property that Magic Raid has is that the two kind of halves of the system can scale independently from one another. So if I need more compute capacity, I just add more processors. And if I need more storage capacity, I just add more disks. And conversely, I can take, and take disks or processors away, which means that I can use for a high diversity of different kinds of environments, this magical thing actually works. Now, unfortunately for all of us, uh, we don't live in a world where Magic Raid can exist, um, at least not on a single box. We live in the real world, and the real world is constrained by money, um, and it's also constrained by physics. And it's really hard, if not impossible, to build a single box with something like Magic Raid inside of it that can scale to the kind of workloads that a company like Microsoft or a company like Google or Facebook have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what do we have instead, right? Well, instead we've got these, right? We've got actual physical racks of machines that are organized into rows. And each of these racks have a, typically have a switch at the top of them and the switches are organized together. When you get enough of these things, you actually have to do a second level of aggregation where the, the switches at the end of the row connect together into a core. And the way that these switches are connected together is the network's topology, right? It's the way that the network's laid out. And Sargon did a great job of kind of laying the foundations for, for the networking side of this, which means I don't have to rehash a ton of it. Um, but this is what we've got, right? And CPU and disk are co-located and they, can fit, they have a similar failure domain so I can lose processors and disks at the same time, et cetera. Now, if you're in the kind of big data space uh, and have been doing anything for the last five years, you've probably seen this little guy. Um, this is the Hadoop mascot. Uh, the Hadoop ecosystem is this ubiquitous set of software systems that were originally derived from papers that Google published in the early 2000s, in particular the MapReduce paper for compute and the GFS paper for storage. Um, and these systems were um, 
wildly popular academically, and when Hadoop picked up steam, they gained a lot of industrial traction. And as the success of those paradigms became bigger and bigger and bigger, um, so too rose this kind of central mantra of that section of papers, which is you have to move your computation to your data. Just show of hands, how many people have heard some variation of this phrase before? Yeah, pretty much like, most of you. So one of the things um, that, you know, four standard kind of uh, tree topology networks, like the ones that uh, VL2 was meant to replace, um, this makes a lot of sense, but it also comes at a cost, right? So if you want to move your, your computation to your data, you have to be aware of where your data is. And the awareness of your location adds an enormous amount of complexity to your system, right? And there are a bunch of different ways that that comes about, right? Um, because your data is spread all over the place and you have to know where it is, your scheduling algorithm becomes non-trivial now because you have to figure out, well, what do I move my computation to? Your processing model also becomes a lot weirder, right? I mean, MapReduce is a great conceptual idea, but the main reason why we're doing that and not just writing a bunch of single-threaded code is that I can take my map task, split it up into a bunch of teeny tiny pieces and move those teeny tiny pieces to where my data is, right? Unfortunately, what we learned really quick after Hadoop got popular was that the class of things you can express with a single MapReduce job is actually pretty limited, right? And so you get this whole class of systems that either start experimenting with other stuff, which is awesome, or they start taking these giant graphs of MapReduce jobs and plumbing them together to do higher level operations. This is where you get your pigs and your hives and et cetera. Um, so, as a, as a practitioner, as someone who's either building stuff on top of these systems or trying to implement these systems yourself, there's a lot of additional complexity here and a lot of overhead. So the researchers that wrote this paper started by asking, well, look, why, right? Why are we, why do we keep repeating this mantra of move the computation to the data to ourselves? Like, are we just repeating this without thinking, or are we kind of, do we, should we, we should examine the kind of fundamental principles behind why we're saying this. And a lot of you are probably going like, duh, Alex, right? Move the computation to the data because remote data is slow. And you know, at the risk of sounding like a two-year-old, I'm gonna go, well, why, <laughs> right? Why is remote data access slow? And if you follow this line of reasoning, you eventually come to the conclusion that, well, it's, it's really just because your network is oversubscribed. Right, what do I mean by that? Um, well, as Sargon pointed out, the kind of state of the art prior to these kind of close topologies with full bisection bandwidth coming out was that you had this kind of tree aggregation structure. And if two machines want to talk to one another, say machine A and machine B in the diagram that's shown behind me, um, they have to go all the way to the top of the tree and then all the way back down to the edge again. The problem here, of course, is that as you go up the tree, the amount of bandwidth that each member underneath that layer has, their kind of proportional share, gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And you can think of it like if I have a rack and the rack has 40 servers in it and I have a 48 port switch, well, I can connect each one of those computers to that switch and then I've only got eight ports left over, right? So I've got, if I've got gigabit links, I have 40 gigabits going up to the top of the rack and I've got eight gigabits going to literally everywhere else. Right? And this gets even worse when you go up from the kind of second level of the network, the, kind of the aggregation layer up to the core, because these core switches are just stupid expensive. Right? So in the paper, they, re they say that this oversubscription factor can be as bad as like 100x or more, which really means that like even if I've got 10 gigabit links to my edge, I'm going to get a teeny tiny fraction of 10 gigabits per second between any arbitrary pair of hosts, assuming that, you know, in the worst case, everybody's talking to everybody else. So this is when the paper starts to do like the researcher thing of like, let's get weird for a minute. So what if I told you that the network wasn't oversubscribed, right? Well, the first thing you go, well, of course the network's oversubscribed, but what if I told you that it wasn't, right? And you go, okay, well, if that's the case, well, then the world starts looking a lot more like Magic Raid, right? Because now, because your local disks and your remote disks are like you have full bisection bandwidth between any pair of hosts. So if I talk to a disk on the other side of the network, 
The only additional penalty that I have to incur, assuming that I'm not network bound because I have too many disks in each of my machines, is you know, the latency to get across the data center, which is you know, a couple micros. But if you're talking about like spinning rust disks, that's such a vanishingly small fraction that it doesn't matter. So for all intents and purposes, disks somewhere else and disks where you are are the same, right? And if disks somewhere else and disks where you are are the same, why make the distinction, right? So then your work schedulers start getting simpler, your programming models start getting simpler. You can start thinking of doing computation over these things, just taking a big queue of work and just pulling off the front of the queue until you're done, right? That'd be kind of an awesome world to live in, wouldn't it? So that's kind of the premise of this entire work, and that's what flat data center storage, which I may abbreviate to FDS to avoid running out of breath in the middle of a sentence, um, is. So flat data center storage, storage essentially assumes that there is no oversubscription in your network, that everybody can talk to everybody else at exactly the same rate at all times. And what they're gonna decide to do as kind of a proof of concept is they're gonna build an object storage system on top of that. So here's an outline for the rest of the talk, uh, which is kind of wrapped up talking about why you would do this. Um, next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the kind of architecture of the system looks like, what the API is that it exposes to clients, the kind of guarantees and the design decisions there. I'll talk about kind of two big pieces of this work, which is how flat data center storage manages metadata, which put simply is, I need to get data, where is it? Um, and then also how they deal with replication for availability and recovery when a disk crashes. I'll talk briefly about the kind of data transport problem and some of the issues they ran into when dealing with these full bisection bandwidth uh, networks that are a little bit non-trivial. Um, and then I'll wrap up by kind of discussing why I think this paper matters so much in the kind of broader data systems context. So this is kind of the block diagram for what a flat data center storage network looks like. Um, you have clients, clients communicate with flat data center storage through a client API that abstracts some of the complexity around the messaging layer uh, away from the people that are actually making the calls. Um, you got a bunch of disks spread all over your network each one of those disks has a thing called a tracked server sitting in front of it. And these are kind of going to be the basic unit of, like, the basic worker that exists in this system. And, and what's interesting is these are raw disks. Like, we're not even putting a file system on this thing. We're just going to take all the blocks on the disk, divide them up into sequential chunks, and just use those sequential chunks and number them sequentially from one. Um, and then somewhere in the network, you've got this metadata server um, and, you know, a, a lot of people kind of go, oh, God, metadata server, single point of failure. Um, but we'll get to why this actually isn't so terrible. And the metadata server's central role is really, as the name might imply, to serve information about metadata to both the clients and to the tracked servers. So in terms of an API, um, flat data center storage is a blob store. So it stores a bunch of things called blobs. And as you know, blob stands for binary large object, so big block of bytes. Each blob has a globally unique identifier and a sequence of tracts associated with it. So a blob's contents are a list of its tracts. In the paper, they talk about the tracts being eight megabytes long, but it's configurable. Um, that number might seem a little bit magical, uh, but it turns out that they just derived it experimentally. They did a bunch of experiments on these 10,000 RPM SAS disks that they had, must be nice, and um, came to the conclusion that um, if you have eight megabyte tracts, that you spend enough time reading a tract before seeking to read another one or to write another one, as the case may be, uh, that you get pretty good throughput off your disk. So there's a nice balance there. And they have a graph showing the kind of trade-off between tract size and seek time. Uh, the API that you get out of this thing is, is pretty straightforward, right? You can create blobs, you can delete blobs, you can open and close blobs by referring to their GUID. Uh, you can figure out how big a blob is. Uh, you can actually extend a blob by giving it more tracts. One of the nice features of this API call is that the return value of extend blob is a sequence of tracts to which you can now write. So if you have concurrent appenders, concurrent appenders are guaranteed to not collide with one another. This might be interesting if you're using these blobs, say, to store like logs or something like that. And then, of course, finally, you can read and write individual tracts in a blob however you want. So the system guarantees that writes to individual tracked servers are atomic, meaning they either happen or they don't. There's no in-between state. Um, all of these calls 
are asynchronous. And that's important uh, because if the calls are asynchronous, you assume that the client's gonna do really deep pipelining of calls. So you can imagine, for example, if I've got like an 800 megabyte blob that I'm reading, I could make, if I really wanted to, 100 asynchronous read calls and just wait for all of them to come back and assemble them together. Now, of course, you probably don't wanna do that because you don't wanna keep an 800 megabyte buffer in RAM, but you can imagine doing kind of the sliding window thing like what TCP does, right? Um, and that is pretty key for reasons that we'll see in a minute. Um, a lot of these API calls are weakly consistent in the sense that if I issue two reads, they can return out of order. If I issue two writes, they can return out of order. If I write to a replicated tract, it might be that some of those replicas fail and I'll have to retry the write. For their purposes, that was okay. They talk in the paper a little bit about how you could kind of shoehorn something like chain replication or some other kind of replicated uh, state machine approach to get strong consistency out of these APIs, but they don't probably because none of the applications that they were looking for needed it. So that kind of wraps up the discussion of how the pieces fit together and what the API looks like. Let's talk a little bit about how you do rendezvous between clients and servers, right? How do clients figure out where tracts are? So the metadata server that I discussed a couple slides ago is responsible for pretty much one thing, and that's serving this thing called the tract locator table. Again, as the name might imply, the tract locator table is there to help clients locate tracts. So this kind of tabular format's gonna get a little bit more complicated once we start talking about replication, but in its most general form, you have a bunch of tract locators, which are sequentially numbered, each one of those locators has a version number that we increment every time we do something interesting. And then those tract locators also belong to a tract server. So you could imagine that a tract server is responsible for storing information about a bunch of different tract locator tracts. So how do you go from a blob with a, a globally unique ID and a tract number to the tract locator number in the table that you need to use to figure out what server to talk to to get it, right? Well, you use this formula, it's pretty simple. You take that tract locator table, you hash the globally unique ID, add the tract number to it, and then you make sure you don't overflow the table by just modding by the length of the table. So each piece of this is kind of important by itself, and, and these were all arrived through, I'm sure, a great deal of blood, sweat, and tears on, on behalf of the, uh, the people that were building this thing. The first in interesting thing about this is the hashing the globally unique ID. And this is really to make sure that even if your globally unique ID space is somehow clumpy, right, like it's not evenly distributed throughout the entire space, that the assignment of blobs to servers is going to be as random as you can possibly make it. And they just use SHA-1 for this. You could probably replace this with your favorite hash algorithm and be fine. Another thing to notice is that they don't add the tract number inside the hash, they add it outside the hash. And this is actually, they say this is something that they didn't expect to have to do at first. But an interesting thing is what this does is it makes sure that especially if you have a really big blob, that it's spread over a ton of different tract locator entries. So say for example, the hash of my GUID is five. My, my track numbers are going to locator five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, right? If you were to do this inside the hash, it's kind of hard to tell whether or not the resulting assignment of track locator entries to tracts is gonna be such that you don't have one server that's responsible for the majority of the tracts in your blob, so you can't take advantage of that parallelism. Another kind of fun thing about this is that Blob metadata, information about how big a blob is, for example, is also stored in a distributed fashion across all the disks in the network. And the way they do this is they say there's a reserved tract number, tract negative one. And if you wanna know where the metadata is, take the hash, subtract one, look it up, and there it is. Um, so this is nice in a sense that you don't have, the, the metadata server isn't a single point of failure for blob metadata. It's not like if, for example, in HDFS, you lose the master node, you're just screwed. Right, you've got a bunch of nice paperweights. Um, so yeah, that's how you go from having a tract to having a tract locator number. So how do you construct this thing? Well, it turns out that's actually fairly straightforward too. You just take the list of all the tract servers in the world, you shuffle that list, 
And then you do that n times, and you concatenate those lists together, and then you number them sequentially, and you're done, right? And this essentially assumes that if you do m permutations, right, that every tracked server, every tracked server is going to be responsible for m entries in that table. If you have disks that are of different speeds, and in the evaluation they do, they've got some 10,000 RPM disks and some 7,200 RPM disks and so forth, you can actually weight the number of times that a tracked server occurs by how fast its disk is, which gives you the ability to do things like, say, faster disks have more stuff in them or something. It really doesn't matter in terms of details, but um, you can pretty much do whatever you want for that weighting. Um, the tracked locator table is served to clients by the metadata server. But what's important to notice is that every entry in this table doesn't depend at all on the set of blobs that are being managed by the system. They only depend on the set of servers, the set of tracked servers that exist in the cluster, which means this thing is stupidly cacheable, right? Because it only ever changes when the, po when the kind of population of the cluster does. And especially if you're dealing with a relatively modestly sized cluster, you don't expect disks, disks to come and go super frequently. So you're expecting that the load on this metadata server is gonna be pretty low. So once you've constructed this thing, how do you actually add tracked servers to the cluster afterwards? Well, it turns out that all you really have to do is pick a bunch of random tracked locator entries and steal them and give them to the tracked server that is joining the cluster. And this happens in two phases, right, because you actually have to copy some stuff from the old guys to the new guy. The first is this kind of pending state where I pick a bunch of entries that I can steal, I steal them, and then I mark the entry as pending. And for each one of those entries, I increment its version number. And these version numbers, I should point out, when a client asks a server for something, it attaches the version number corresponding to the tracked locator entry, which allows the server to kind of look at the, tr the version number, compare it with its own, and if they don't match, it can just go, nope, and the client can go back, grab the tracked locator table again, and retry with a new version to whatever server happens to be there. So incrementing the version number helps you with that. While you're in this pending state, any read requests to tracked managed by that, or for that tracked locator entry, go to just the old owner, right? So for tracked locator entry one, they would just go to A. But all writes go to both the old guy and the new guy, so A and the new server at the same time. What this ensures is that the old server has the authoritative state of all of the blocks that are managed, or all the tracks, rather, that are managed for that tracked locator entry. The new guy has some fraction of that. So as long as you can keep the new guy up to date on writes, then as soon as the new guy is done copying everything from the old guy, you are sure that the new guy has all the state that the old guy should have had. And that's actually what happens next. So once the copying's done, you can essentially say, okay, now the update is committed. I can get rid of the old tracked server's entries. The, the, that tracked server can garbage collect the portion of its state that corresponds to that tracked locator entry. And uh, now you have more servers, and you can do this as many times as you want. They, they go into some details that I won't cover here about you know, what happens when you've got concurrent ones of these things happening, and what happens if something fails in the middle of a migration, and so on. So we talked a little bit about how you figure out where your tracts are. Now let's talk about how you keep from losing data when something fails. So classic way of doing that, you store multiple copies. So in a replicated uh, situation, the tracked locator table looks pretty much the same, except instead of one tracked server being responsible for every table entry, you've got some number. In this example, I've got three. And uh, one of the things that's nice about this is that you can have variable replication in this system if you say in the blob's metadata, how many replicas should I have? And then you just take the first n replicas in this table up to the maximum replication amount. Um, so that gives you some flexibility there, which is nice. One of the things that they kind of recommend and do for their evaluation is that they make sure that every pair of tracked servers appears in this replicated table at least once. And you might ask, well, that's, that means that the tracked uh, 
table is going to get really, really big, right? Why, why did they do that? Well, if every pair of tracked servers is represented, then that means that data that is owned by a given tracked server is going to have a huge diversity of other tracked servers that hold replicas of the data that it has. And this becomes really important when we start talking about how recovery works. So you might ask, like, OK, well, I've got this kind of every pair is represented. I can add more replicas. How do I pick which replicas I should be using for each row? Well, you can do it at random. And I'm not entirely sure if that's what they did for the evaluation. But they also point out that you can actually do custom failure domain specification. So for example, you probably don't want all three replicas to be inside of the same physical machine, because if its power supply explodes or the rack it's in melts, um, you're done, basically, right? Because you've just lost all your copies. Um, so they say you know, they don't go into a great deal of detail about how you specify these things, but you can specify them. So your API operations change a little bit in the face of replication. Um, in particular, you have to make sure that some of your metadata operations happen in the right order uh, so that you don't get confused about you know, how big your blob is or whether it even exists. So if you create, delete, or extend a blob, which are kind of the things that modify the state of a blob, you actually deal with a kind of primary backup system, right? Where you do the write to the primary, the primary two-phase commits to the other replicas, and then only returns to you once that two-phase commit finishes, right? So you're sure that when that call completes and comes back to you as a client, that all three of the replicas of the blob's metadata state know that that metadata state is the same. When you're talking about writes, you have to do a write to every single replica and only return to the client when all of those writes complete. That makes sure that all of your replicas have the same value. As I mentioned before, weak consistency here. So the API may come back and say, try the write again because I couldn't talk to the third guy. And you may actually have to wait until that third guy recovers sufficiently. But you know, there's a nuance there. When you read, you can read from anybody at random, right? Because you're sure that your writes are going to be the same. And if you read from a random replica, then you can kind of spread the load out, right? So that's nice. So what happens when a, a tracked server fails in this kind of a scenario? Well, the first thing you have to do, um, and I'm going to say that A fails here just because it occurs a lot in the table. You have to go through your track locator table and you have to take every instance where A occurs, you have to delete that, that portion, and you have to replace it. Well, interestingly enough, if you're used to something like RAID, you might have this notion of like, if a disk dies, I have to replicate that disk somewhere. And here, you don't really need to do that. You just have to make sure that every tract that that disk stored is in, in this case, three places. And you don't really care which three places because data locality isn't a problem, right? So I just take. All the entries where A occurs, I replace them with random things. I just realized I replaced A with A when I was trying to be clever. Ah, oh, stupid. Anyway, um, once you've done that, you pick another replica. And you can pick that other replica at random. And you say, you are the replica from which the replacement will restore all the tracts that A had for this tract locator entry. So what does this mean, right? This means that when a disk fails, what you're going to see is a bunch of different tracked servers talking to a bunch of other different tracked servers all at the same time, frantically trying to replicate all of the tracts that that tracked server had back up to the full replication rate. But what this means is that instead of a situation where you had one or two disks that you had to sequentially read from to do a restoration, like you know, if you had a RAID 5, you've got to go all the way through and it takes like a day. This thing can recover from the failure of a terabyte disk in a 3,000 disk cluster in about 20 seconds or less. Right? And this was the part of the paper at which my mind is just blown. Right? Because you look at that and you say, that by itself is justification if you're talking about a highly available blob store. Right? Because your biggest fear when you're dealing with replication is that the time that it takes you to recover will be longer than the time that it takes you to fail enough that you lose data. And if your recovery time's that short, I can just go around like pulling disks out at random merrily 
And it probably doesn't care, right? This thing is like the honey badger of object storage systems, right? So this by itself should just make you go like, holy crap, right? So now we've talked about how you do replication, how you do recovery, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems they ran into with data transport, which really is how do I get tracts from servers to clients and back again, right? So um, as Sargon pointed out in the previous talk, um, this thing assumes a full bisection bandwidth network. In particular, it assumes something that kind of looks like this, where you've got a lot of path diversity and a lot of tiny commodity switches. And if you wire together your tiny commodity switches in just such a way and you use ECMP to make sure that you can use that diversity of routes, you get full bisection bandwidth, right? That's nice. Um, and you can do this at data center scale, right? Even better. There are a couple gotchas, though. The first gotcha is that I have to make sure that there's enough networking bandwidth at each of my machines so that my disks aren't bottlenecked by my NIC, right? So what do I mean by that? Suppose that I've got a disk that's, you know, a 10,000 RPM disk. You can probably get about a gigabit per second of sequential bandwidth out of that disk. Kind of best case, right? If I have a 10 gigabit NIC in my machine, I can put 10 disks in that machine and that's pretty much it, right? Past that, my disks won't be able to go at full speed because they'll be bottlenecked by the NIC. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the full bisection bandwidth that these kinds of topologies provide isn't guaranteed. It's stochastic. It's statistically likely, right? And in particular, it kind of relies on being able to deal with an enormous number of these really short flows in order to provide that statistical guarantee. Now, ECMP, equal cost multipath routing, really likes short flows to random places because it gives it this diversity that lets it spread things out across all this path redundancy that it's got. Unfortunately, TCP hates short flows because TCP needs to ramp up to figure out what its bandwidth is supposed to be, and if you're not giving it that much data to transfer, it won't know. There's also this horrible thing called incast, which I don't have enough time here to really do justice to, but you know, the, the bottom line is it's terrible and it causes your TCP throughput to collapse to essentially zero. The thing that's nice about flat data center storage, though, is that because they have full bisection bandwidth, problems like incast don't happen somewhere in the middle of the network where you can't really do anything about it. They tend to happen at the edges. They tend to happen at the individual machines themselves. And so what you can do is you can actually implement an application layer solution to this problem. What they do is this variant on this thing called RTS-CTS, which in a nutshell really is before I ask you for something, I'm going to ask you if you've got enough capacity to give it to me. And you're allowed to say no. And if you've got enough capacity, you send what's called a clear to send message, which says, yeah, yeah, go for it. But you're only allowed to have a certain number of these things in flight at any given time. And that prevents you from the situation where everybody asks you, can I get a tract from you? And you say, sure, and then everybody goes, give me my tract, and you've got a giant queue in front of you and your TCP connections time out and reset before you can service everyone. So, this has been the whirlwind tour of flat data center storage. I'd like to spend some time, though, talking about why this paper, I think, is, is important from a data systems perspective, from a systems perspective, from a general philosophical perspective. I think that this paper is a great example of what I like to call co-design. Now, co-design is when you consider your hardware and your software and the workload that that hardware and software is supposed to do as kind of three corners of a nice beneficial triangle. And you design something that works really well if all three of the points on that triangle are constrained, they're fixed. But if any one of those points starts to get fuzzy, then maybe some of your assumptions kind of start to fall apart, but that's okay. Because you know exactly what you're building, you know exactly what you're building it for, right? So flat data center storage is a blob storage system. It's designed for full bisection bandwidth networks. And it works great for that workload. 
And there are a bunch of evaluations in the paper showing how it scales and so on. Um, I'm going to focus on one particular piece of evaluation because it's personally relevant. Um, and that's their performance against the sort benchmark. So the sort benchmark is this thing that is this collection of benchmarks that measure sorting as kind of the yardstick problem in data systems. And this was originally developed by the late Jim Gray, one of the demigods of, of database systems, as a way of kind of figuring out if you can pick a really hard thing that a data system like a replicated database has to do, but one that's really easy to actually describe, sorting would be a great example of that, right? Because you gotta read a bunch of stuff, you gotta move stuff to where it needs to be locally sorted, you have to do some non-trivial computation on it, i.e. sorting it, you gotta write that stuff back down to disk in sorted form, you gotta do all that stuff all at once, all the time, as fast as you can. So this really puts a stressor on any data processing system, really. There are a bunch of different benchmarks here, like dealing with energy efficiency and capacity and raw speed, but they all come in one of two general flavors. And the first, fla the flavors are named after kinds of cars. So there's the Indy flavor, um, and I didn't know this before starting on this sort of thing, but Indy cars are not practical, drivable vehicles. They're designed purely to go really, really fast. Like you wouldn't want to go to the grocery store in one of these things, whereas Daytona, like, you're talking about cars that are actually drivable that you've just really souped out, like, and just made as fast as you can possibly make them. The analogy is direct to systems, so systems in the indie category are allowed to kind of cheat, and they're allowed to be really, really specific for the task at hand. Daytona-style systems have to solve a broader class of problems, and that typically deals with things like record sizes and data distribution and so forth. So, Flat data center storage competed in one variant of this called a minute sort, which is how much can you sort in a minute. Um, and it competed in both categories, and it won both categories by a pretty substantial margin. So in the Daytona category, it was competing against the venerable Hadoop. In particular, it was competing against a cluster that Yahoo put together in 2009 of about 1,400 machines. And Hadoop was able to sort about 500 gigabytes of data in a minute, which if you look at just that raw number, you go, wow, like 500 gigs in a minute, nice, right? But if you divide that by the number of disks in the cluster, the throughput turns out to be about three megabytes per second per disk, which is, you know, really a shame considering, you know, how fast those disks ought to go when they're being driven at full speed. Flat data center storage, on the other hand, they had a cluster of 256 machines, and they were able to almost triple that number. So that brings their per disk bandwidth up from three megabytes a second to 46 megabytes a second. And you know, the, the perfectionist in you might say only 46, right? But they are reading and writing these disks at the same time, right? So you know, you figure divide by two. Now in the indie category, they competed against my thing <laughs> and they won by a, by a good amount. They won by like 10%. Um, we had a, a little fewer machines than they did, so our compute efficiency was, was a bit better. But to their credit, both they set this number and they did it with a sort application that was a very thin shim on top of this general blob storage layer. So whereas we spent a long time building a thing that sorted and sorted only, they did a thing that did blob storage and sort happened to be this really simple app that they built on top of it, um, which was really just read all the objects, sort all the objects, move the objects to the right place to aggregate them and then write them back down. So it's really good at what it does. I hope I've proven that. But it's important, it's as important, I think, to talk about what flat data center storage is not as it is to talk about what it is, right? Flat data center storage isn't really built for networks that are oversubscribed, right? If you stuck this thing on a standard, quote unquote standard data center network circa 2012, um, where you had that factor of 100 to one oversubscription, it probably wouldn't do that great, right? Because a lot of its assumptions are predicated on this fact that your remote disks and your local disks are the same. It also doesn't try to be more than an object storage system. This thing isn't a database. You know, it's not trying to do anything more than loading and storing big binary objects. But 
The key here is that by constraining the workload, by constraining the hardware, and by building the software based on those constraints, they were able to get huge, huge, huge efficiency gains. Right? And you know, I feel like I've kind of talked a lot of trash about MapReduce, but I think that MapReduce is another example of this when viewed in the right way. So if you look at MapReduce and GFS, they came out of Google in the early 2000s. Google was not nearly the giant corporation that they are now. They weren't small, but they were you know, kind of scrappy. They needed to store a few copies of the internet on some machines, and they didn't want to immediately go bankrupt by doing that. And so the only solution that they could come up with was let's buy as many cheap, crappy PCs that are gonna fail all the time as we possibly can, let's wire them together in a standard tree topology, and let's do bulk synchronous processing on those things. Suck the internet in, do page rank on it, spit the page rank graph out, suck iteration I in, spit out iteration I plus one, repeat until I have the thing that goes into Google search, right? Now if you look at this from constrain the hardware, right, thousands of cheap crappy PCs, constrain the workload, bulk synchronous processing, the system that they came up with works really, really well for those two constraints. But what you see a lot of, unfortunately, is people who will buy 10, $4,000 Dell blades, not to pick on Dell, with you know, dual redundant power supplies and liquid cooling and RAID 6 and all this stuff that make them really, really reliable, and then only have 10 of them, and then run the exact same thing that was designed for 10,000 machines that are gonna catch on fire any minute. Similarly, a lot of the success from Spark kind of comes from this fundamental assumption that MapReduce just wasn't designed for iterative workloads. It wasn't designed for OLAP. It wasn't designed for a lot of these things. And that's okay, because it was what it was designed for, it's incredibly good at. Spark comes in and says, well, actually, you know, if you, if you wanted to constrain for an iterative system or an OLAP system, here's how you would do it. And they actually end up doing it really, really well. So what can we learn from flat data center storage. The first is that it's a great example of doing a ground up rethink of what an architecture should look like based on a fundamental assumption. But it's great because it's ambitious, it's really ambitious. But it's also like I can envision actually sitting down and buying the parts and building this thing. And that differentiates it, I think, from a lot of work that tries to do these ground up rethinks but ends up having some fundamental linchpin that it turns out makes it unimplementable. The other thing is, again, you know, to harp on this co-design idea, they optimized like crazy for their hardware and their workload and they got a big, big bang for their buck out of it. Um, and the last thing, you know, if you were to pitch the abstract of this paper to someone even in 2010, they would tell you that you were crazy, right? They would say, there is absolutely no way that you can get a 10 gigabit per second full bisection bandwidth network up to that scale. It's cost prohibitive, it can't be done, the hardware doesn't exist. Well, it turns out two years later, not only did the hardware exist, it was cheap-ish, right? I mean, it only cost them like 30% more per machine than it costs Yahoo for that Hadoop cluster, but you know, we're talking like a six or seven X improvement there, right? Like that's a pretty big return on your investment. So I guess like one of the things that's nice about this is that, you know, it reminds you both as a practitioner and as an academic to constantly be questioning all of these assumptions that you feel like are the gospel truth of wherever you happen to be. Because tree topologies were like a gospel truth of networking for 20, 30 years and Suddenly they weren't anymore. So I'll end with a very brief shameless plug. Um, another reason why I like this paper is that it resembles in spirit a lot of the stuff that I worked on in, in grad school. Um, we also assumed fully balanced architectures in the sense that our disks were a bottleneck. Uh, we also assumed a full bisection bandwidth network, although unlike Microsoft, it was because we could only afford one 10 gigabit per second switch, so we had full bisection bandwidth on that switch. Um, the whole work is predicated on the fact that you probably don't need really fine-grained fault tolerance in MapReduce if you've only got 50 machines because your machines are a lot less likely to fail uh, on average than if you had 10,000 of them. So what happens if you get rid of the ability 
to not completely restart a job if it fails. And you know, we, as I said before, we, we got some pretty big wins out of this. Uh, the papers are, one of them was published in an SDI uh, same year that FDS was. The other one was published in the symposium on cloud computing the following year. With that, I am done. Thank you for your time and attention. I am happy to take any questions. Thanks. I would take issue with one of your latest slides where you would say, you said two things. One, GFS isn't suitable to build an OLAP system on. And kind of by implication, you said that FDS may have been a good target environment for OLAP. And correct uh, me if I'm wrong there. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, so I may have sounded more doctrinaire, doctrinaire than I actually am. <laughs> um, clearly you can build OLAP systems on top of GFS, right? Like, I mean, Impala exists. I know. Um, but uh, the, I don't necessarily, I mean, in fact, that was one of the things is like flat data center storage, it is an object store and that's pretty much it. Like, I don't, you can build a file system on top of this thing and they, they did um, and it performs really well. Um, but I wouldn't build OLAP into this thing, right? Like any more complicated interface, I feel like would just kind of, it'd complicate things too much. I, I don't mean so much sense. build it into the system. I mean, the system is a nice abstraction. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but if you're using network bandwidth for that initial disk read phase, you're not making that bandwidth available to later phases in your execution tree. So say you're doing a typical kind of two-stage, uh, you know, join and then aggregate. You actually need that network to do the shuffle after the fact. Mm. And if you're using it for the initial scan, you're necessarily kind of uh, blocking out other workloads that may be running at the same time. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think that you could, in, in the example that they provide, they're basically saying it's all blob storage all the time, right? And that you're not really dealing with any other kind of data transfer really other than getting the blobs on and off. You could imagine if you wanted to read and write that stuff from disk, just doing it all disk to disk, right? But that seems kind of inefficient. You might also imagine, you know, in a multi-tenant scenario, you could deal with not having like a 10 gig NIC with 10 gig non-blocking bandwidth all for disks. You could maybe reserve enough additional capacity for that, for that ex excess traffic. You know, I'm kind of ad-libbing here. But like, if you took the density of your disks in your network down, you could probably get enough spare capacity that you could have both of those things operating on the same network fabric without having either of them stomp all over the other one. It seems like a good idea, but then you do necessarily just get lower disk throughput. Yeah, there's the workloads are typically kind of scan bound. That's the thing, right? Like you, you really kind of like, there is this fundamental, I mean, you could, if you were really, really crazy, you might be able to build like a data network and a compute to compute communication network and just layer them on top of one another, either physically or logically, right? Um, and you might be able to get something nice out of that. But I mean, that's, it'd be an interesting thing to look at for sure. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. So, so uh, I have two things. Uh, okay. The first thing in response to Henry's question, uh, Facebook recently put out a paper called, um, or a paper basically that do, does TDMA over data center networks to solve this exact problem because they actually moved to a non-data local compute uh, scheduler for Hadoop and okay. they started to run into the problem where they were generating too deep queues and they were breaking their compute. Um, the question that I had was a couple years ago, uh, Berkeley Amp Lab came out with a statement saying that data center or disk locality and data center computation is dead. Would you agree with that? Um. Well, I think the, uh, the classic cop-out answer is it depends, right? Um, I think it depends a great deal. I mean, there, if, if, if memory serves, and it's been a while since I've read that paper, but their, the premise of their argument, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, um, the, because the bandwidth to remote disks is so high now, because networks are so good, and because the latency of the remote path versus the local path is not different by enough to matter, why do you care whether the disk is here or somewhere else? Um, I think that that's, that's an interesting, it's an interesting idea. I wouldn't go so far as to say that disk locality doesn't matter and has been replaced by memory as kind of the, a, a lot of that I think was, um, it's, it's clear that RAM is getting a lot cheaper I don't think it's cheap enough at this point 
to be talking about it being a replacement at scale for the kinds of things that, you're, that you deal with in a data center. Um, the thing, though, is that a lot of use cases and the vast majority, let's be honest, of, of companies are never really going to hit that scale, right? And so in that case, like, you know, and RAM Cloud's based around this, Spark's based around this, this whole notion that why don't I just keep everything in memory? It's so much faster. And, you know, that's been a really cool trend, I think, in the last couple of years in systems. And it, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. But I don't think the locality issue is really ever going to go away. It's just going to slide up and down the memory hierarchy. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, I basically had the same question as uh, the previous person. Uh, so I asked about the importance of locality for in-memory or SSD-based workloads, but you sort of touched on that already. Like, locality does still matter if this is true because you are essentially oversubscribed on your network. Well, I mean, I think that with locality, at least, again, ad living, locality seems to matter more the faster your storage layer gets, right? If you're talking about SSDs or PCI-attached flash, like, it could very well be that the latency of going across your network actually is a fairly decent fraction of the latency of your actual operation. So you may actually want to view those two things separately. Again, it really depends. Like, if you're talking about something that's, you know, that's throughput bound, locality probably doesn't matter to you all that much. If you're dealing with something stupendously latency sensitive, then, you know, maybe you want to direct something so that it's going to take the, the shortest possible path between where it is and where it needs to go. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, though. Yeah, sort of. I mean, I work on HDFS, and in particular, we add in-memory caching to HDFS for actually Impala, because many of our customer workloads do fit easily in cluster memory. And right. in that situation, you really want to be local to the memory, because you can zero copy read it at gigabytes, like tens of gigabytes per second, which you just cannot do over network. So you get, you know, order of magnitude improvement in your scan rates by Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that I think, you know, coming back to that key realization, right, that most of your workloads at the kind of cost per gigabyte of RAM, are, they might fit in RAM, right? And, and a lot of this stuff kind of is, is predicated on that guess, right? Um, and, you know, it seems to be backed up. You know, there's been a lot of really successful work, both, you know, and Paul is a great example of this, where, you know, you can get the scale of HDFS, but if your working set is really, really small, you can also get the latency of one of these in-memory systems, you've got to have your cake and eat it, right? It's a, it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, whoops, ooh, nice, nice trade-off to have. Yeah, Almost just in general, I sort of feel off. that the storage world's moving to a more tiered situation where you have, uh -huh. um, we're talking about having like maybe even memory on the CPU now, right? So that's like super fast, right. even faster than RAM. Then you of course have SSD, and then like disk is right here, your, your last resort, you almost never go to disk if you don't avoid it. That's sort of how I view things going forward. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, definitely like the, the whole memory hierarchy thing, um, you know, it, it, there just get to be more layers and the top layer gets faster and, and there are interposition things in between, right? So, you know, you even look at things like flash cache, right, where you've got SSDs caching disks and then RAM caching SSDs and then cache caching RAM, right? Um, so, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of always going to be there, just as, as, at least as long as the memory hierarchy keeps looking the way that it does, which it may indefinitely, we don't know. Thanks. Um, uh, hi. As uh, someone who's sort of less familiar with the, the history of this stuff, I was just kind of curious what the the chicken and the egg here was. Like, uh, were, what was the order of, like, this work versus these uh, full bisection, you know, uh, networks and... Uh, so if memory serves... The full bisection bandwidth literature started appearing in MSDI and SIGCOM like 2007, 2008 timeframe. Um, and this was released in 2012, which means they probably started working on it like 2010 timeframe. So I would say the networks definitely came first. But you know, like it is kind of this chicken and egg thing where they had data center workloads that they were having a lot of trouble with, hence bisection, full bisection bandwidth, and then then they just started looking at those workloads one at a time and went, what can I do with this now? And flat data center storage kind of came out for the blob storage case. Wow. Thanks. No problem. Um, over here. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, so um, this might be a naive question because I, I just haven't bought hardware in a while. But uh, you mentioned uh, that they got, um, uh, or. Uh, they achieved results with commodity switches and That's right. some other thing implementing ECMP. 
Uh, I was just curious about the mechanism, what they, what they used to, to build that. Oh, like, like what, what was it built out of? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the actual vendor that they got these things from, but you can, at least when we got, oh God, when we got these 10 gigabit per second switches, they were, you know, you could get a 96 port 10 gigabit switch for about 25 or 30 grand, um, which in the, in the data center switch kind of market is a little bit expensive, but it's not like exorbitantly expensive. Um, I think that they built those, the, that network out of 48 port switches arrayed together into this topology. Um, they, they say in, the, in their talk, which they're actually, their original talk is online, um, so I'd encourage you to watch that too. Um, but they're, they say in their talk that um, they made a vendor that supplies 10 gigabit per second ethernet cables very happy. Um, so they, they bought an enormous, enormous quantity of them um, and a bunch of 48 port switches. But so do the switches already implement ECMV, or was that? It's all, uh, they're all just standard ethernet switches. It's just they're going over SFP plus cables mm -hmm. instead of standard Cat5. Okay. Maybe I don't, maybe I haven't completely answered your question. Yeah, that's all right, I'll go read the paper. Okay, well let's take this <laughs> offline for sure. I could ask you one other question. Oh, please. Um, so I was just curious about um, uh, when you're describing the, the, uh, the mechanism and the networking, um, and you have an RTS CTS, and you have, um, uh, and you have ECMP, which is establishing a flow. Uh, it's starting to look a lot like ATM circuit switches. That's uh, interesting. So I was just curious if there was any comparison made to that. In, uh, well, you know, every, everything old is new again, right? Like, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there. I admit not being stupendously familiar with the kind of current state of the work in this space. I think Sargon's probably a lot better person to talk to about this than I am. Um, but yeah, I mean like, once you start talking about like reservation for flows that are really short, like it starts looking a lot like those kind of systems. And um, whether or not they actually went back and, and rediscovered, or not, not rediscovered, but like re-implemented a protocol in this context is interesting. I mean, one of the things I know that, they've, that has been done in, the, uh, in this space is that they take long flows and actually put them over circuit-switched optical links. Um, and there's a, a paper that a, a friend of mine at UCSD did that um, will actually dynamically balance those large flows onto these circuit-switched optical paths. Um, which looks very much like kind of like a classic telecom solution to the problem. Um, but it turns out that if you get those elephant flows off your network and you allow the mice flows to balance, um, that you get a lot, of, a lot of nice properties out of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff from kind of the early days of packet switched networking that, that can really be applied here. Um, yes. Um, so I had a question about um, some of the replication techniques that they use in this. It seems okay. sort of like, I mean, I don't think the replication scheme is actually the most important part of this paper, but they do include an entire section on it. True. Um, it seems like they assume almost a fail stop kind of failure scenario, yes. scenario in almost every single strategy they have. And so um, for production systems is actually not sufficient. And so I didn't know if there was any follow-up research that you knew about where they've gone and expanded upon this because that seems like the logical next step if you were to productionize this. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, like, they, they never really... Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this work, like, especially academic work, just kind of sweeps failures that are not fail-stop under the rug. And they just kind of... Because when, when you say that a write is atomic, it's like an eight megabyte write. Like, how are you sure, right? Like, there's, a, did they actually go all the way down that road, right? And then similarly, like, what if a tracked server fails by just belching random requests across the network at random, right? Well, and I don't even um, think they handle, like, partition scenarios, right? Because they say if a failure goes oh, down, yeah. if it keeps talking to a client but not the metadata server, that's totally unhandled, as is the scenario where um, uh, the whole thing Sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. But the point that you were on before is it's right. it's it's interesting that they assume fail stop and like the whole metadata server thing too. They're sort of like, well, maybe Paxos will solve this, but right now we just like wake someone up if it fails. Yeah, the 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 thing like they they very much kind of don't even like consider partition tolerance as a thing, um, which is kind of odd, right? Um, I know that so in NSDI 2014. Um, they did this system called Blizzard, which is a file system on top of flat data center storage. And 
I don't know if they've actually productionized it, but from what I understand, they at least hooked SQL Server up to it and let it go. And I would imagine that SQL Server would be incredibly unhappy if some of this stuff happened, right? So, I mean, a lot of this stuff that goes into MSR, like, they're really aggressively trying to tech transfer it out. But I have a feeling that when they tech transfer it out, like one of the first things they have to do is spend like another six months to a year like re-examining all of these things in light of like actual scale out production models. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind here too is like this, they've got some mitigation strategies even for like the size of the tracked locator table in a replicated scenario, right? Where if it gets, if you get to above like, I forget what the number they gave was, but it was like five or 10,000 disks this thing gets so big that you just can't even hope to store it. And they talk about all these different mitigation strategies, but it's kind of like evident from reading the paper that they kind of like, they whiteboarded a lot of them and they never actually sat down and like made them work at scale. Oh, um, which, yeah, and I think it's totally fine for this paper because it's like sure. the seminal piece in this field, right? And then I think, like you said, Blizzard was the follow-up piece, yeah. right? So like that might be interesting to look at to see where they've gone. For sure. Cool, thank you. No problem. Nobody has any more questions? All right. Great. Well, thanks, folks. Yeah, so thank you for coming. And also, thank you to GitHub and Kelsey and Drew for uh, pulling this all together for us and making it super easy to just hang out. Yeah. Uh, so in keeping with Papers We Love tradition, uh, we're going to get out of here and go to 21st Amendment, which is just down the street on 3rd. Um, and a big pack of us will lead you there if you haven't been. Uh, so yeah. yeah, that's about it. So thanks, guys. See you next month. Yeah.